And we're live. Okay. Um, I don't think anyone's really showed up yet, but that's fine because okay. it is book. Um, so hello for the people who are not here but might be here on the rewatch. Um, Chloe Thistle Verse. This is my channel. I review mostly science fiction and fantasy by black authors, and I'm joined today by the wonderful, the illustrious, the one and only Brie Writerly. Um so Brit Brit writerly. Ew, I'm sorry. You did. It's okay. <laughs> we hope that they're literate. If they're not, I'll repeat it. <laughs> Brit writerly. Um Brit's an author tuber. She's a grad student. She's bringing the um the knowledge and uh, the reading of nonfiction to book two, at least for me. Um is there anything else you want to ask about this question of yourself? Let's go with that. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought we could work through and do like a chapter by chapter summary of the book okay. I was discussing today, which is Searching for Sycorax Black Women's Hauntings of Contemporary Horror by Dr. Kenitra D. Brooks. Yeah. Dr. D. Brooks. Um, so. I just had a little thing written down, and then you can tell me if you want to add something or if you disagree. And okay. Get this summarized. So, uh, okay. So there's an introduction. She kind of talks. Oh, sorry. It's a preface. And she kind of talks about this movie Vamp with, um, gosh, why am I blanking? Grace Jones with Grace Jones. She talks about her introduction to horror and movies and what that was like for her and why she got into it. And then we go on to the first chapter. No, sorry. Then there's an introduction, um, which I'm not really going to get into, but it talks a little bit about, like, mostly film horror through the ages and just kind of lays out the basic, like, summaries of each chapter. And then we get to chapter one, the importance of neglected intersections, characterizations of Black women in mainstream horror texts. So... Um, in terms of like the analysis frame that she's using, it's a lot of like media studies, like mostly film and comics in this first chapter, and also like black feminist um, writings throughout. And I feel like the one that I remember the most was um, Bell Hooks, and I think also Bonnie Bartold, I think came up a lot. And basically this chapter, um, Brooks, you know, kind of just says, like, what's the state of Black female characters in horror right now? Basically, not a whole lot of characters um, in mainstream horror, um, usually absent or just kind of like a sidekick. And in terms of what that looks like on the, um, critis on the critic side is that there's basically a lot of critics looking at, like, white women and then... Um, Black critics kind of looking at um, horror films through the genre, of, through the lens of um, race and blackness, but not really paying attention to gender. And so she's trying to look at um, black women, characters, race and gender together and see what there is to see in horror. And in the first chapter, she brings up two characters, um, uh, one that she likes more than the other, um, Selena from 28 Days Later and Michonne from The Walking Dead. And she talks about what works or doesn't work about those characters. And um, I think basically she said that she chose those because, you know, comics and film are kind of where it's at. It's where a lot of people are in horror. And also because I think she said like Final Girls were just kind of like the easiest place to find Black female characters. Um, and the next chapter, um, what is it? Black feminism and the struggle for literary respectability. Um, she talks about sort of the establishment of like a black female canon. And her argument is that the general strategy was to appeal to like the dominant ac academic sensibilities when creating a canon to prove like the worth of black female writers. And so that generally meant not um, dealing with uh, authors writing science fiction, fantasy, horror, like other genre works. And she argues that that was to the detriment of um, 
these writers because a lot of what elevates um, books are people talking about them, spreading the hype, reviewing and critiquing them. And she, I think she pointed out specifically that this, she argues that it was to the detriment specifically of Octavia E. Butler because she said that this push was happening around the time when Octavia Butler was publishing and it did like, it took a little bit for Octavia Butler to become like a, a household name. Um, like it definitely wasn't when she was first starting out, but she was getting a lot of recognition. And then chapter three was black women writing fluid fiction and open challenge to genre normativity. She kind of gets into what are different genre labels? Why are they tricky? Um, they're often contested. And she talks about um, speculative fiction as a label, Afrofuturism, and argues that um, for a new genre called fluid fiction that she thinks best describes what Black women are writing. Um, and that it encompasses a very purposeful uh, transgression of boundaries and also like writing with meaning, like not necessarily invention for invention's sake. And she mostly focuses on Nell Hopkinson and Nettie Akor for in this chapter. And then in chapter four, um, she introduces the concept of folklore horror, which is horror that incorporates African-American spiritualities, cosmologies, religion, um, superstition and belief and how that merges with the everyday and she also talks about music as conjure in that chapter. There's like a, there's a bit where she talks about Nina Simone, who else was it? Memphis Minnie. Um, yeah. So that was pretty much everything. Um, is there anything you feel like I would need to add? Hey Kiki, hey Emma Ray. That was pretty comprehensive. Okay. <laughs> It's like, wow, I'm like, yep, yep, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, hitting all the points. Yeah. I have a so okay. Sorry, I'm just seeing it on the comments now because I've been like in the book, like, what, what was the chapter name? Look at my notes. <laughs> um, so I guess we could talk a little bit about like overall thoughts on the book. Um, just something like we talked about. Actually. Actually. Huh? <laughs> As I thought my eye just completely twitched, but that's not really relevant. Go on. Okay. Um, in terms of like, what do you think this book was like? I don't know. I guess for me, when I do a review, I kind of talk talk about like, what do I what do I feel like the book was marketed as, and do I feel like it was marketed correctly, and who I think it's actually for? Um, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, like behind the scenes but like mm -hmm. I came into this thinking that like I don't read a whole lot of horror and I was excited to like learn a lot more like black women writing horror and um like taking a deep dive into like a few of the people whose works I have read and it's not really a literary analysis book I feel like it's really more talking about categorization than anything else. Like I think that the title and the like synopsis in the dust jacket make it sound like it's like a, like a media analysis, like looking at representation. And I feel like besides the first chapter, that doesn't really come back up again. Like we, mm, we do talk a bit when it comes to like genre classifications and stuff like we do talk a bit more about it but I don't like I felt like the first chapter was like a really close reading of like the walking dead and 28 days later and like what those characters were doing and like stuff about them and then I felt like the other ones it was kind of more like about building a global classification system and so it felt like things were just kind of brought in more as like examples to talk about an idea um you know yes no no yes which i'm oh, like and I, I didn't come here for that i did not come here for that so out yes the first chapter was really tight on walking dead particularly um mission a's i don't know if i'm pronouncing that correctly um either i've watched or read. watched or read um mission a's character and i was like oh like this is this is a really tight analysis on that great um which still is not what i can't well i mean 
it was she was reading the comic particularly so um so fine but i was really hoping to get some examples of literary analysis of horror um and like just this because there's i was hoping to get some literary analysis of horror like text not like the screen as text and the closest i came to a horror text i feel like was chapter one and mm -hmm. after that it was more the theoretical history the canonical history um how the can't like all it was all very interesting like the how the library of congress classifies sff so i was like these things are interesting in and of themselves but as a whole not what i came here for i don't love her invocation of sula didn't love um, wait, wait, I'm blanking. What did you say about Sula's horror? When, when I think it's chapter three in fluid fiction, and I have lost it, obviously, because you don't I have to like bring it up. You just give me like a quick. Little I mean, I don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. Like, I'm just like, why are we talking about Sula? Because it seemed like rather, rather than talking about like horror she was beginning to talk about like women who were acting outside of normal gender expectations so in that Sula and I forget the other Makita maybe no Jackie I think like Sula and Jackie were two um, black female characters who acted outside of the norm and Sula slept with any man even white men like that was like that whole thing and like being punished by Sula being punished by the bottom and them both just being punished by um with death by the society or the book itself for acting outside of their social outside of their prescribed gender roles and i'm just like sure what why here like even if i agree with that point in general i'm just like but i want to talk about horror text or at the very least science fiction and fantasy text because i can rock with you talking about beloved as mm -hmm. a science as a as a fantasy book even as a horror you're not gonna get me on sula for any of those things though and so i was just like it felt too broad in some places to be useful for my purposes. And I kind mm -hmm. of lost the thread several times of what exactly her purposes were because it seemed so broad and she was working across so many genres. And and I don't wanna jump ahead to the, to the fluid fiction chapter, but at a certain point I was just like, I understand what you mean in theory to a point, but what is the practical utility? What is the practical utility? And that's just sort of where I ha I continue to try to get off the train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. mean, when you like kind of go through the chapter summaries, like I felt like things didn't really connect to each other. Like I had a, I had asked um, Britt if she thought that the chapters were kind of like published individually and then like compiled um, in the safe for this book. Um, because I didn't feel like there was a whole lot connecting them like yeah. there's a there's a lot of talk you know about um like in the second chapter like oh like the canon and like who's pushed out of the canon so i was like oh so like in the next chapters where we get into the horror we're gonna like center those people who have been kind of pushed out of the canon um which mm, sort of like she she does talk about nella hopkinson a lot but um, sorry, Nala Hopkinson a lot, but like, I was conf I was confused because her thing is that like there's this like I guess little hierarchies even within genre. So like, there's like literary fiction and then there's like genre fiction like SFF, and then within SFF, horror is kind of like floating around, doesn't really have a home, and like she argues that sister mine is horror and like i could see that having read it but also i was like 
but like Tanana Reeve Dew is like right there. Um, you know, Linda Addison um, was right there. And like, these are people that I know that she like knows of or has worked with. And so I was kind of wondering why there wasn't more spotlight on people who are like known for horror when like, you know, just the chapter before we're talking about how they're kind of like ignored within the canon um, or like don't really have a home within the canon as it is. Um, like I felt the genre stuff was interesting and it like definitely got me thinking about things, but I didn't want more from it. And it like the last chapter, there's like a bit where we talk about music and I was like, this feels like it came out of nowhere. Like there's all these mediums. Like we were like in the first chapter, we're looking at comics and film and then we don't really talk about comics and film ever again. And then we're talking about novels and short stories, which really aren't too far a hike, I feel like from each other. But then at the end, we're also talking about music performance. And like, these are all vastly different things and yeah it did feel it felt like there was like the first chapter was kind of doing its own thing and then I felt like there was sort of a a connection between the last three chapters but it, it wasn't as like strong as I would have wanted it to be like if I had been like organizing it um <laughs> or if I've been like an editor or something, you know, like, yeah, I, yeah. let's just leave it there. <laughs> agreed. Agreed, agreed, agreed. So did you want to go through each chapter? Did you want to talk about which chapter you liked best? and why I'm trying to remember your order of yeah. operations for the night. So in terms of chapters I like best, um, I think it was the last one, the chapter on folklore car. Okay. Um, I was, I don't know, for some reason the idea of fluid fiction wasn't really working for me. Like uh, she argues that speculative fiction is kind of passive as a label, like it has kind of people don't really know what it means like I think it started out as like a academic like literary criticism term in like the 70s or something and it had like one specific definition and now there's like kind of multiple definitions and it's like not very useful in that way is her argument and and she proposes fluid fiction which to me I'm like I can I feel like when we're I don't know I don't really have a big interest in creating genre labels but I feel like you kind of have to account for the fact that people aren't going to read up on the history when you make the genre label. Like it kind of has to stand yeah. on its own. And I don't know if fluid fiction on its own to me conveyed purpose, conveyed, like I got grounded transgression from it, but I don't get like, I don't know, to me the idea of something being fluid doesn't necessarily feel purposeful. Like, I don't know. When I think of fluids, I think like, you know, kind of sloshes around, you can manipulate it or whatever, but it doesn't feel like it really encapsulated the things that she wanted it to. And so for me, I was just like, this is like an interesting thought, but I don't know what the purpose is. I don't know who's going to be adopting this as a label. Um, right. Yeah, so right. I, to me, folklore car as like a genre label, I was like, oh, I feel like this is something that stands on its own. I feel like this is something that has a, a use. I feel like this is something that I can like use to talk to people about things. Yeah, about yeah. And then to your point, and I'm look, I the chapter that when she's talking about fluid fiction, she's saying like black women authors do not currently eschew the label of speculative fiction, even as I present its growing inadequacy as an efficacious descriptor of their work. Many of the black women discussed in this work have proudly published under its banner: Nalo Hopkinson, Tanana Reeve Dew, Nadia Corcourt, and Kate Jemison, Cheshire Burke, and Kini Abura Salam to name a few. Okay. And then she like quotes Nalo Hopkinson in a 1998 interview and says, I write fantasy. Actually, I say speculative fiction because my work includes elements of science fiction, fantasy, dark fantasy, horror, and magical realism. I feel like we need to pause there because I, as a writer, am not a super fan of um, 
of revising of revising writers on their own work. So if Nalo mm -hmm. Hopkinson says, and she's been doing this for a while, says, I I actually refer to it as speculative fiction, then who are we and, and who we are is, is critics and readers and whatever. So you're welcome to your opinion. But to say I find it largely inadequate when you know that black women have had to work to get into the space anyway, I don't see the utility of calling a genre that black women have have taken into themselves inadequate. Like it's clearly not inadequate or they would not be calling upon it and trafficking in it. And I think in a lot of ways, speculative fiction is doing what you are insisting that fluid fiction can do better. And I'm just like, what is your investment in this? Like what is your investment in, in pushing fluid fiction over speculative fiction? not convinced that it's something that we really need to do and to your point who's gonna take that up beyond this book otherwise like why are we giving a chapter to it as opposed to really having a town hall with speculative fiction and asking more of it if more is what we need but to say like it's largely ineffective i'm like i, I don't agree I think that people, I think you can say it has limits if you want to, but people are, people are using it and it has been freeing for writers who do transgress genre normativity. So in that way, I'm just like, this feels a bit like you just want to propose a term. Thank you. <laughs> it felt a bit like she wanted to propose a term, which I get as an academic writer, we love neologisms. But come now. That's all. Did you have a favorite? Yeah. Wait, I think we're the first one. Uh, just as just in so much as the first chapter was, I the closest I got to like um, literary analysis that I found compelling. Um, I, it still is not, and by useful, I don't mean like, this is completely worthless. This book is useful to plenty of somebodies. It's just for my research, not as much as I thought that it was going to be, but I did find the liter the chapter two, the literary respectability. I found mm -hmm. that chapter very interesting, particularly. Oh, yeah. Talk about it. This is kind of what you do. <laughs> I found that very interesting um, and talking about the way that Toni Morrison and Octavia Butler pretty much had the same fans and should have been enjoying this like similar um, play at the time, particularly because Beloved, I want to say, was like Toni Morrison's third book or something like that. And then, and I'm sure Chloe is fact checking me right now. Um, there was like a fact check look that came upon her face. Yeah, I was about to do a little too much. <laughs> but, um, I think, is it what, second, third? Which is it? I'll let you know when I find out. Okay. Um, and then Kindred is definitely Octavia Butler's fourth. So I'm like, they're both, they've both been on this. And Kendra was published first and then Beloved. And Beloved is kind of the book that we that we hold Morrison up for. And that was published, ooh, let me, let me do math. But Kendra was published in 1979 <laughs> and Beloved was published in 1987, eight years. Okay, cool. Um, so why, when Kendra is the book that like, people who are not scholars of Octavia Butler go to Octavia Butler for, and Beloved is the book um, that people who are not scholars of Professor Morrison go to Professor Morrison for. Kendra came out first. So it's just like that. It explained a lot when when Brooks was saying, well, when, when, when the canon was being formed to garner Black women's literary respectability, they went to the Black clubs women. Make okay now I understand <laughs> because the black club the black clothes woman is in the late 19th century early 20th century, um, and that's that is during the progressive era like we're we're fighting for space outside the home so that 
then creates a very like Francis Harper, like Ida B. Wells, and Julia Cooper. All of those women have very particular public identities, and there there's really kind of no access. Mary Church Terrell, especially Mary Church Terrell, there's no access to their private lives. They didn't want any, and so to say that like that's where the literary canon comes from from that from that generation of race women it makes sense why you would want something very standardized for the first iteration of the canon and octavia butler was pushing against that now so was beloved if we're being like critical with the reading because and not to like go too far into this because brooks doesn't talk about it but if we were really to do like a case study of kindred and beloved those books have a lot in common they're both neo-slave narratives they both um mess with temporality in ways that sort of smudge um what we consider neo-slave narrative genres to do so um Ashraf Rushdie, if I'm pronouncing their name right, they have an entire book on like neo slave narratives and say like there's basically three kinds of neo slave narratives third person um, historical account, first person um, life story account, and then like a look at the, the legacy of the trauma of slavery for later generations. But what those three categories depend upon is very strict delineations of time. Kindred and Beloved play with that because they play with time. And so I think that's what Brooks, even though she didn't, she even then didn't go into like a literary analysis of why those two books would have had the same the same readership because those books are alike in a lot of ways um so that's the other thing is like when she chooses to do literary analysis i'm just like i don't understand these choices you're making but mm -hmm. this is not a literary like this book is not a book of literary analysis and to be fair she didn't really say it was, but the word literary yeah, yeah. does come up an awful lot for this to not be literary analysis. So it's also just like, that's why for me, it feels like she's doing so much. Like you're, you're just doing a lot across a lot of genres and it doesn't feel cohesive. And it's hard to stay invested in a book that is that seems to be changing projects and lenses every chapter and is not published as a reader this is a book. If it was a reader and I was like, okay, good. So I know I'm going to be getting like distinct essays. Like you're saying it reads as then say that, but that's not what it's published as. So I was just having a real hard time rocking with her on all these different investments, but yet, and still the second chapter I found most interesting for talking about the, the canonical history. Um, and also when she, and maybe this was actually chapter three, but I also found it interesting when she was talking about the Library of Congress's, um, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So the definitions of science fiction and fantasy, and the fact that speculative was literally in the definition of fantasy, I was like, so I have even less reason to part with that term for your proposed fluid fiction. But go on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was interesting to me. Yeah, in terms of what Brooks does and doesn't say about what it's for, I forget what about, well, I guess we already said it in the beginning, but like when I'm reading like the synopsis in the back and like the Goodreads stuff, it literally only mentions the literature. Like if I did not open up this book and look at the table of contents, I would not know that there's stuff in here about film or music or any of that. Um, so that could also just be like whoever was marketing it, not doing a great job of getting it to the people who are going to wanted and needed. And also Sycorax is a literary figure. It's from Shakespeare. So even if we're just reading the paratext and looking at the title and the blurb and like, like you said, the table of contents, you are naming a bunch of authors on, in the blurb. Like you're talking about N.K. Jemison, Gloria, like you're naming a bunch of authors. You are invoking a literary character like even if you don't say the word literary that seems to be this the stage that you're setting yeah um in terms of what the purpose was i got weirdly into genre distinctions after reading this i feel like if you're interested in like a meta history 
or like thinking about categories and what works and what doesn't work, I feel like this book is very interesting, but like you would not know that from reading the Goodreads synopsis. You would not know that from reading almost anything on the back of the book. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna say about it on Goodreads, but there were things in here I found very, very interesting, but it just was not what I was hoping was not what was advertised. Um, in terms of when you're reading, were there like little things that surprised you as you were going through? Mm, yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, I was, surprise is not like really the word. Um, or like things that were new, you're like, oh, that's interesting. The, the literary, the literary respectability chapter, I was like, oh, that is very interesting. But like you said, I have a particular investment in, um, and and in, in the way that respectability is used. Um, and so I was like, what you gonna say? And then I was reading, I was like, oh, okay, this is really interesting. The Toni Morris and Octavia Butler thing is very interesting. The the um the history behind making the canon interesting. Um, what was surprising was the way she went on to use Morrison, i.e. her invocation of Sula in the folkloric horror chapter, I think it was. And I was just like, you lost me. So there were a couple of things that I found surprising only because I didn't see how they fit into her project. But even in the introduction, I found it, it was very slippery for me to hold on to what her project was precisely mm -hmm. like I would understand it in one sentence and in the next sentence I would lose it again and I was like this this does not bode well for me in this book and lo and behold um I think I found a lot of things that were surprising just because I don't read a lot of so like for me she quotes bell hooks a lot I feel like that's like the main scholar that stood out to me and I haven't really read anything I think by bell hooks it's maybe one book but it's like very basic intro like theory book um so i feel like there's a lot of things there that i found surprising um i'm thinking specifically of to the note oh the idea of like looking as resistance when she's talking about movies um because i feel like when we're talking about i don't know i guess like regular day-to-day -day activities that are like resistance I think people talk about like um reading a lot in terms of like the history of that being like illegal or like not available to black people in the U.S. for a while um and I think that just like in my understanding people often talk about like tv is something like passive something kind of like um I don't know I guess like easy or like um I don't know it's kind of like a relaxing type thing. Like I feel like the, in my, when I was going up, growing up, it was like very much dichotomized. Like, you know, TV's gonna rot your brain. Like, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, reading's good for you. It's like eating vegetables or something. And like, <laughs> um, so it's just interesting to like when she got into like the idea of like looking as resistance and like what that also has looked like historically for Black people in the U.S. I thought that was very interesting. Like, um. And that's very rooted in bell hooks in the oppositional gaze, which she talks about in chapter one, I want to say, with, with when she has that, even that epigraph of, of hooks saying that I don't, I don't just want to look, I want my look to change reality or something to mm -hmm. that effect. Um, and, and in the essay that chapter one is sort of adapted from, she says very clearly and very early, I think she may say it here too, but it's hard for me to take those two apart because they are literally just the same chapter adapted for different purposes. Um, but she says like, I am thinking very heavily with Bell Hooks and her, her, um, her essay, her chapter, Oppositional Gaze. Um, and Bell Hooks has a book called Black Looks where she talks about representation. And so I think for in that way, um, when she's when she's talking about looking, she's talking very, it's just another way for saying representation on the screen. So I thought that was like very interesting. And then what was the other one? Um, there's a thing I was thinking about where she talks about like religious ritual as like scientific. 
Um, or even like, I guess, I don't, I don't know what you call it, but like, you know, if you, if like a, a boo hag were to step out of her skin, you're supposed to put pepper in it so that she can't come back and like you're supposed to throw mm. rice on the floor so that she'll be distracted mm. counting it and not come after you. And oh, yeah, the idea, straw hat. Yeah, this idea of like a methodology to things and like mm -hmm. having like a very precise like rule to things as being scientific and her like kind of asking like what is science fiction because I think that's like an interesting question. Um mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, because I think that there's just, like, this focus and, like, fascination with, like, technology that is interesting and limiting, um, <laughs> and I'm just kind of curious how we got there and, like, other ways of thinking about science, um, I don't know. So I was, like, intrigued by that, but I also wasn't sure if, like, you know, is that like just like I think it was mostly African Americans that she's talking about the book. Like, is that like just for like African American like fiction or African American cultural stuff? Because like, you know, um, if we're talking about like just like wizards, Europe-based stories in general, like ingredients is kind of like a common thing. Like, was it I have new something mm. called like? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's yeah. not really specific, and so I was wondering if it's just. I don't know, she didn't really get into it. I would have been interested if she had, but I was wondering if that was like a argument specifically about like African-American culture as it relates to fantasy, or if that was just kind of like talking about how labels in general are kind of slippery and our understanding of like science versus magic is kind of slippery. Um, that was just something I found interesting. Yeah. Wait, was that question directed to me or were you saying that's a question you had when you were reading that? That was just a thing I had when I was yeah. reading it. I don't know if that like raised your interest at all. I'm like, you remember uh, about it. I mean, after a certain point, like I, I really did find some things in this book interesting. So I don't want to be like, this was totally useless. I found her her and in, her interrogation of science fiction and fantasy through the Library of Congress. I found that really interesting. I found her her chapter on literary respectability interesting. I found her reading of um her invocation of this this that iconic um reader or anthology, um, All the Women Are White, All the Black Tremendous Movers Are Brave, the way she breaks down that aphorism and then talks about like all the women are white, talks about the final girl, all the blacks are men, talking about um, the rapability of black women and like the, the hyper focus on black men represent the race. Like I think that that the way that she carries her intervention through in that first chapter is really strong, but it really felt like after that she got kind of distracted. Um, and it feels like this, the, the like, well, what is science? Tell, all of those things began to feel like, like a distraction that continued to occur. And I was like, I don't feel like I was prepared for this to, to come up as much as it did in the way that it did. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there were, there were things that I was like, oh, that's, cool, interesting, I enjoyed that. But on the whole, I just was like, I don't feel tethered to your theoretical argument. I'm not even sure I remember exactly what it is. And even if I kind of do remember, I'm just like, what are we here for again? Like, we're talking about sticker acts and these Black women who are disappeared in horror and also Black women writing in horror and how they're um, engaging in and genre non-normativity or whatever but like also this is not new so like it, it was just very much like mm -hmm. what are we doing here like I'm not really especially when I'm reading a book especially when that's not my field I really need to know why we're talking about this in order to be able to categorize it in my mind or I'm not going to be able to take anything with me off the page. It's just going to be like reading stuff and forgetting it as I read. And so I couldn't really get a hold of this book. as I mean, I did as a whole in the way that I have to read things like reading the introduction and just like skimming through like, okay, cool, fine, read the book got enough of it to know what I what is useful for me. But as far as just like talking about the book as a whole, I'm just like, Professor Brooks, 
I just needed a bit more focus on your part so I can have a bit more focus on mine. Um, that said, I did find her, her discussion of the boo hag very interesting. I like in the conclusion, I liked her discussion about anger and the misreading of, of Beyonce as like, can Beyonce be a feminist and want to wear another woman's skin? I found that super, super interesting. That was really good. Because I'd never heard that interpretation before of it as like a reimagining of boo hags. Um, Me neither. But I don't I mean, I was like, so if we're like that, that is a useful, that's a useful um, application of your folklore, your folkloric horror um, genre lens. Like that was more of that, please. Like that was very interesting i saw the utility of it when the application but i didn't see enough moments of that to be able to get me through the text in any sort of comprehensive way but i really liked that moment and i was reading through dread nation for the class that i am that's starting tomorrow on black women science fiction and fantasy novels and so when she was talking about the the black final girl and i was reading deathless divide I was like, I'm definitely seeing how Jane is being punished for being a final girl, for being, for for surviving. Like she's not really seen as like, you're desirable to flirt with, but like, I can't make you my wife because you go running into danger. And it's like, didn't she save your life? Isn't that how you met her? Like, so I felt like in that way, I'm like, oh, cool, cool, cool. Like that, that reading was interesting. And so then the, when she went to the boo hag in the introduction and talking about wearing another woman's skin, I was like, mm, I wish you brought the final girl back to talk about what it is to be a final girl in that post-apocalyptic world and to have to wrestle with um, desire and desirability and and being seen as like a non-desirable subject or object depending on if you're talking about like black women and going back to mission and like black and then women being like rapeable um but the boo hag and beyonce that reading i i wish she had done more it makes the conclusion i wish she had brought that up earlier though and done more with it and talking about more like complicated ways to represent black women and horror and the way as she did in the conclusion which i found so generative the way that black women use horror to push back and and reading and watching that um video of anger and just hear and like hearing Beyonce say like I can wear her skin if you want. I can use her clavicle as a cane, her teeth as confetti. I'm like, oh, this is this is horrific. But I and 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 coming at that from the perspective of the boo hag, I'm like, there's also incredible vulnerability and feelings of of unworthiness also under here that I. I have to break, like, take this other woman upon myself to hold your attention. I'm like, that's that is something that is more interesting. That I wish that she had brought into her literary analysis earlier on, but I think she left the energy of chapter one when I would prefer she carried that through and and maybe brought some we wove in the things that we get later into extending that literary analysis of characters like Michonne. Um and and others <clears throat> that was a lot yeah no I mean, it was, it was very interesting um i my last thing was like random it has nothing to do with anything we talked about before but you do more literary analysis stuff right so like have you heard of the idea of like a genre ghetto before it's not like the <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it pop up. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? No, and when you brought it up, I hadn't yet got there, and I was like, "What the what?" <laughs> and then even when I read it, I was like, "Was that necessary?" Because I've heard it a couple other places. I'm like, "So is this a thing?" Because the first my introduction to it was Stephen King. <laughs> Which, when you said that, I was already like, I'm immediately over this entire thing. I don't, I'm already over it. <laughs> the fact that a white man is talking about a genre ghetto, I said, sir, I'm going to need you to take two steps back and have several seats. It was some time, like a year ago on Twitter, I forget what prompted it, but he randomly was like talking about horror as a genre ghetto. And I remember 
was reading that and being like, what is going on here? What, what is happening here? And then she mentions that, she kind of uses that same exact phrasing here as well, like a genre mm -hmm. ghetto for like genre, genre fiction, um, like specifically fantasy and horror and like mostly horror in this book. Mm -hmm. That's some other random essay that also use that word. And then there's like a TV trope article on like the genre ghetto. I was like, what is it? Chloe's <laughs> like, what is going on? Why are we saying this? I don't get it. I feel like it's so weird. <laughs> I I feel like you need to come up with another. Someone needs to come up with another word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, put your energy into that over trying to to debunk speculative fiction. I don't know, and especially so weird, especially when Stephen King said it. It's like all these genres are like pretty much like science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Like a lot of the bigger names are white men, so it's like really weird to have them come in and be like the genre ghetto. <laughs> Because my thing is like, who, who was in the genre ghetto? How did it become ghettoized? Yeah. Okay. Shady. <laughs> Stop speaking. And that's when like take several steps back and have several seats. Like you didn't mean anything polite by that. I don't even have to see the tweet to know that you should not have said that. And I don't. I'm not fond of the term, so I'm just like. Yeah, this wasn't this wasn't a win for me. Like this, like this can definitely go down as like highly anticipated reads that sort of disappointed for me. It wasn't quite what I was looking for. Although I was able to to get some gems out of it, I'm just like I found her in her individual essay that chapter one is based off of more useful than this book as a whole. Mm. So I think we've already talked a little bit about this, about how it fits into the discourse. Um, but we could go into it a little bit more, please. I don't know. I have things to say. Kind of. Yes. Like. Go ahead. <laughs> um. So we talked about this a little bit in like uh, DMs and stuff, but like I was thinking specifically of the. The uh, invoking the image of Sycorax and being like, what was it? She used Bell Hooks' concept of the absent presence, right? Like the idea of something not being there, but still having an R, having an influence on things. And it made me think of The Dark Fantastic a little bit by Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. Um, and I. I'm just rethinking how I read things after. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But um, I was thinking of that because she has, she's looking at um, fantasy and it actually is kind of like broad for her. She focuses on the fantastic things that give an air of wonder. So I think she looks at a uh, science fiction, uh, paranormal romance. And I think one of them was just kind of a, a straight fantasy and as case studies for how black female characters are treated and her she has the dark fantastic cycle which is was it spectacle which is like a monster appears um they have some like othering physical traits hesitation um people see the monster and it like disrupts everyday life violence people try to kill the monster get rid of the monster and then a haunting, um, which is basically that the monster provides the main source of conflict in the story. So they kind of always need to be around in some capacity. Um, like you can't just have a land free of monsters. And she, um, Thomas uses that framework to talk about how black female characters are handled in, in fantasy. And I was thinking specifically about the final stage, the haunting, because I mean that really maps onto Sycorax in the introduction. Um, I don't know if we really get into more of it, but I was just kind of like it was just like a very immediate like thing I saw because I think in Thomas's book she calls it a present absence, 
And she has an invoke hooks. I think Thomas focuses more so on Toni Morrison is what I'm remembering mostly. And so that was just something like I saw and I was thinking about. Um, and I think I brought it up and you were like, you could kind of see the parallels, but you were like, it's not as thoughtful as that, as that cycle um, in terms of like a black woman's place in horror, where it's kind of more of like an omission. It's not necessarily a, a haunting in the same way. Um, Say that again. Uh, like I brought up like, it was like in a Twitter DM, like, oh, uh -huh. like, this makes me think of, um, you know, this book. And like, I think I can see like the absence of black women in horror as like kind of following this dark fantastic cycle. And you said kind of, but also like in the dark fantastic, it's more purposeful. Yeah, um, I mean, she gives us this. And here it's just like, they're not there. It's like, it's not even like a thought. I mean, she she does. I mean, that's what the entire book is about is their absence. But like the entire book is about their present absence. But we get like a full cycle layout in in the Dark Fantastic. Whereas here we talk about we ju we're just continuing to mull over their absence. And then like we go into genre normativity. So we don't really talk about the the different the re the reasons for that absence or the way like she, we get chapter one in the introduction and that's really it whereas the dark fantastic continues to return to this cycle and map it on to these different texts that she's reading and she also was juggling multiple mediums she talks about the hunger games which is a novel she talks about um the vampire diaries the tv show she talks about merlin another tv show so like she also was going through different mediums about her her analytical lens is consistent whereas for brooks i feel like it's shifting too much between lens and medium it's just hard like you need some sort of consistency throughout the the book or your reader is going to be like i am having trouble putting all this in one project and i, and I also literally i wrote down like haunting Evan elizabeth thomas so like i definitely saw that but it didn't seem as purposeful maybe was too rude a word it didn't seem as consistent um as the dark fantastic cycle yeah, i brought that up because i think the dark fantastic dark fantastic was the first like literary book i had i think i'd really read on my own like okay. i mean i was a stem kid so i just had textbooks and stuff so like that was like the first like theory book i was reading like cover to cover mm -hmm. and for me, I really just wanted like the final chapter restoring was what I was really excited for. So I was like, oh, it was just the one chapter. And like, I think like in retrospect, I'm like, wow, that was actually like a very, very tight book. Like I really like the, the cycle and then the last chapter when I first read it. And now I'm like, that was actually like a very, very tight book. Um, and I think for me also is because I hadn't read or seen a lot of the things that were mentioned. Like I hadn't watched Vampire Diaries. Um, I had sort of been like, I think Hunger Games is like kind of shortly after I stopped reading. So like I hadn't read it. And I think I watched the movie and was very checked out. So like I just didn't relate to a lot of the franchises that were brought up, but like, yeah, that's why I mentioned the thing about changing ratings. Um, so that was one thing I was thinking about. And then I think I was also thinking about it was just a, an article by El Tumult Duchamp, who I think founded a small like feminist press. Um, it was like a, it was published in this anthology, Stories for Chip, which is a um, collection of essays and short stories dedicated to Samuel R. Delaney, who was a black gay man who wrote science fiction, like started off writing, I think the late sixties. And then he, I think he wrote for like decades, like, and he wrote stuff outside of science fiction. So he did like science fiction. He did some like memoir and like nonfiction type stuff. And it was just an anthology like about him and his life and his influence. And this was the one where I mentioned earlier where this one also used the phrase like genre. And I was like, 
is this like this a, temp a technical thing? Like people keep banding it around. But um, it was interesting because it talked about um, different ways of like legitimizing a genre. Like it was talking specifically about, I think cyberpunk was kind of the focus and like the, the tussle over like, when did cyberpunk start? Um, who are the people who are important in it? And it was talking about how um, sort of one way that genres can gain legitimacy is kind of by pulling in um, works by authors who are kind of like well known and popular in their own right and being like, oh, this is actually like our thing too, like it relates. And I think after reading this book, um, so I think people could make that argument for talking about like Beloved by Toni Morrison or um, I think there's like a couple others where you could, let me, let me think of something more, but I don't know. Like, I feel like when I'm like looking for like older books that are fantasy, there's kind of like pulpy fantasy. And then there is kind of like this book that wasn't really categorized as fantasy at the time, but it does have like these elements in it that we might say is fantasy. Um, and Kindred wasn't categorized as fantasy when it came out. Like she talks no. about that in interviews multiple times. They didn't know what to do with it because they were like, "It's not science fiction. Yeah. There's no science in it." They like they ended up just publishing it as fiction. Yeah. Um, like I think a book that happened more recently where it like kind of played out like that was um, I think Remembrance by Rita D. Woods. I think mm. a lot of people hadn't heard about it because it was being shelved as like African American fiction or like. Um, I don't know what the contemporary, it's, it's not a contemporary, but like, or a historical fiction, but like, I haven't read it yet, but I've heard there are fantasy elements of like, women who can see the future, women who have like these supernatural healing abilities, women who have the ability to cloak things from people that they don't want. Um, that it's kind of, it gave me Salt Road vibes. Salt Road by, by Nalo Hopkinson, it gave me salt room. And, and, that, and that there were three generations of women who were connected across time and that one of them, at least like one of the time periods where there was a woman who was engaging in some, I mean, magic system is too, is too academic a term, um, a cultural, a cultural magic of some kind. So it was, it gave me, Salt Road vibes for that reason, the structure of it. But it also was like, I was like, is this a neo slave narrative? Which, like, there, I feel like there are some like things that have come out recently that could be categorized as neo slave narratives. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that was one more recently where I remember people being like, I'm seeing it shelved in these places, but I think that there are fantasy readers who would have an interest in it and it would have a home in um, fantasy shelves as well. Mm -hmm. And for us just thinking about how, I don't know, maybe it's not necessarily like drafting people in or like, at least when it comes to like African-American women and black women writing like fantasy and the fantastic or horror and the horrific, but like, just like <laughs> a natural view of the world. Like, I think I just stumbled upon this Toni Morrison quote um, by accident, but um, someone had asked her um, on, like what she considered the genre that she wrote and like, do you mind if people call your work magical realism? And I think she had said like, it's not really magic realism because it's just like the world as it is, it's not magic, it's just reality. And her quote was, my own use of enchantment simply comes because that's the way the world was for me and for the black people I knew. There was this knowledge, uh, there's this other knowledge of perception, always discredited, but nevertheless there which informed their sensibilities and clarified their activities. It formed a kind of cosmology that was perceptive as well as enchanting. And so it seemed impossible for me to write about black people and eliminate that simply because it was unbelievable. So I've become indifferent. Oh, no rest of it's on her feelings on the label, but I don't know. I, Cause I think I was using that thing in my head. Like, Oh, like we don't really need to be like yoinking people out of the genre, but then being like, but it's, is it really, or is this just kind of how, you know, people think of fantasy? Is that just something that's like more like cultural to how like the stories we write and how we perceive reality um, in terms of 
that type of stuff. Because I don't know. Because I feel like um, we talk about Beloved by Toni Morrison. Like, I think Toni Morrison said it wasn't horror. Like, I don't know if she really picked a genre for it, but I feel like people had asked her if she thought it was horror, and she was like, not really. That's not how I think of it. Um, do you know more about it? Because it's been a while since I had read or listened to the interview, so I could be misquoting. Was no, no. I... I... I haven't been I haven't been up on my inner I I'm teaching that book, so I've been revisiting the book, but I have and it's in my dissertation. So I have my own way of coming to it that Toni Morrison would probably be like <laughs> step over here real quick. Um, <laughs> so I I'm not the one to ask because I'm definitely for um, and not not definitely for in a way of like we should all read it this way, but I think that to Brooks's point about literary respectability, there's definitely a sequestering of a particular cohort of Black women: Gail Jones, Gloria Naylor, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker. Sequestering those women into literary um, fiction as like something that is worthy of study, um, and I'm just, I think that we could have other readings of those books as well. And so like in reading Toni Morrison through the lens of science fiction and fantasy, um, particularly fantasy, do I think that she would agree with that as like a publication genre widespread? No, um, that that horror magical realism, because I think to, to your point about her quote, that's just what is. And so to call something fantasy that someone understands as a way of being in the world is slick disrespectful because you're you're implicitly undermining the reality of it, because fantasy, like as Brooks gives us in those that one, two, three, four, what is fantasy in the Library of Congress, like it's implicitly something that is speculative, that is not real. There's a presence of another world. Like all of these things undermine um, the believability of a thing. You're suspending your disbelief for it. And so I think if we were, if we just started saying, which I'm not, yes, this is Tor, yes, this is um, fantasy, that's that becomes problematic for for the work and for for Setha, for Paul D, for Beloved, for Denver, for all of those characters whose life that is. And, and you know, fantasy definitely, but even calling it horror because using Brooke's definition, which she admits is like a little wide, um, that this horror is like the presence of the other disrupting what is normal or something like that. But yes, Beloved is a ghost, and yes, she's a hate, and yes, she comes back to haunt, but also. That is like baby Sug says to Setha when she's like, maybe we should just move. And she says, where are you going to go? There's nowhere in the country that is not full to the rafters of some dead Negroes um, anger or emotion or something like this is just what it is to be black in, in diaspora. And, and so to say like, oh, it's horror. Is it horrific? Yes, it's terrible. And the book acknowledges that. But to say that it's horror if off of that that definition that Brooks gives, it didn't necessarily, in Beloved anyway, it isn't in a, so much as read as an interruption, like it does, things get disrupted, but like, not in the same way as like a zombie apocalypse in Dread Nation interrupts life. Like this is part of black life. This horror, this, this experience of horror, this dealing with trauma is part of black life. It's not interrupting that. It's still always already happened, which is also the point of the novel. Mm -hmm. Did I spin out? How did we get there? No, it was a, no, you didn't spin out. Okay. Um, and um, to your point, Miss WC Reader, um, I remember talking with um, Drain of, uh, she has a bookstore, uh, Rebel Women's Lit, and she focuses on Caribbean fiction. And uh, she does like stuff on YouTube as well. And like with panels of people and like uh, performances with people, um, kind of like community building stuff. And I remember her talking about basically how that doesn't really, those genres kind of like don't really map neatly onto Caribbean fiction as well because of the incorporation of folklore and just like, how they view the world. And I think for me, it's something I was thinking of as like out there. Like, cause I think my first encounter with it was, um, 
or like I guess the idea of like what is fantasy because what is reality um, was with Freshwater by Kweke Mezi, which um, I think when it was initially released, I don't think they were really making it super known that it was a memoir because they were like, it's going to be hard to market to the U.S. audience. Um, and so I think people were talking about it a lot of different ways. Um, like, I kind of figured that it was partially based on their life just because of the it's parts of it just seemed like it was based on their life um, from what I knew of them. But I think once they, like once the book was released and they're like doing events and stuff, I think they were more like, it's a, it's nonfiction. Like it's literally my life. Like these are entries from my journal, <laughs> like just in this book. Um, like this is, this is my reality. This isn't like a fabrication. Um, so I think I'd always, I've been thinking of it more so something like out there, like in other parts of the African diaspora, not necessarily something that was also happening with African American writers. And so I think that reading this book really made that like click into place for me. Um, and I need to read more of Toni Morrison's nonfiction. <laughs> her, I mean, her essays. It's like, you're such a beautiful thinker. Like, Sites of Memory, The Ancestor as Foundation. Like, the, I mean, they, they're older essays, but like, still, they're good. And also, I'm about to tweet at Disney, because they also, like, used a quote from Toni Morrison's essay, um, Sites of Memory in Frozen 2. Olaf the snowman. Wait, yes. no. <laughs> yes, no. They did. Wait, what? Well, no. Yes, they did. I'm <laughs> like, listen, I'm about to have to pull your card because I love Frozen too, but part of the reason I love it is because there's such a foundation of Black women's intellectual history. But you're going to cite these Black women. So, Olaf, when Olaf, have you seen Frozen 2? No. Okay. <laughs> I saw the first one, I was like, this is cute, but it didn't need a sequel, so I... I... <laughs> yeah, no, Fro Frozen 2 was a lot better than Frozen. Oh, I don't have an issue oh, with Frozen, wow. but Frozen 2 is actually an amazing movie. I've seen it literally, like, no less than five times, and will be watching it again, and again and again. It's good. So, Olaf the Snowman <laughs> Oh says, my god, no. <laughs> yes! <laughs> he says... And he, this is when he's like in the midst of like spouting off a whole lot of facts on their way into this forest. And he was like, did you know that water has a perfect memory? And then he follows it by saying like, so in effect, this water that you're drinking has moved through whatever, whatever. And then they, whatever. But Tony, like that is from Toni Morrison's essay, Sites of Memory. She says like the Mississippi used to, they, they say that the, that they're like straight in the Mississippi. And when it's, floods um, and they call it like flooding when the water comes back but it's actually remembering itself and that whole beautiful space where she talks about like flooding as remembering she says water because water is perfect memory that's why the, that's why it's remembering itself so when Olaf said that I was like <laughs> come again and said like that becomes like super important to the plot of the movie and then in um I think it's in Show Yourself, which is a um, a song that Elsa sings near the end when she's like finding this really important knowledge because the whole like memory is really important in Frozen 2 in really great ways. Um, there's a part of the song where she like her mother's memory is like singing with her in this like really beautiful duet and also spectral um because like her mother's memory encased in ice or something and she says you are the one you've been waiting for all of your life so we're just going to quote alice walker because that's definitely the title of one of her collection of essays like we are the ones we've been waiting for so that's why I'm just like, listen, I love what you're saying. I just need you to cite these black women. So I said that was a snowman too that was full off. Oh, the mouths of snowmen. <laughs> I mean, Olaf be saying some deep stuff, to truth be told. Like Olaf be saying, be really having these moments of like 
stark clarity followed by entire songs where it's like that is absolutely not true but it's also <laughs> like he's saying like the exact opposite of what is true in a way that you know the writer of that song knows that they're saying the exact opposite of truth to say the truth all those characters very interesting so let me start an essay on olaf Sounds like that song is going to be new. Here's the thing. It's not. It's a, it doesn't fit your thesis, though. At all. Like, <laughs> I, all I want is for them to cite Toni Morrison and Alice Walker for these very, very pivotal moments in the movie. That's all. And I will be tweeting Disney. Thank you for reminding me. We read the <sighs> Absolutely. Like, mm-mm. Kiki said she fell asleep during the first Frozen. Watch Frozen 2, Kiki. It's good. I, I don't know. I also, I don't know. My attention span's weird because I can really watch a lot of cartoons, but like when it comes to like real people movies, unless it's like a cooking documentary or something, I kind of can't focus. Um, you said a real people movie? Uh, live action, like they have actual actors in it. Like I watched the Marvel movies. I watched some of the DC movies. I watched True Grit, a Western, but like, it's like very limited. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm a Disney baby. So me and Disney, complicated though our relationship is, we're always going to have to deal with each other. And I just have to call them on their crap when they do these things like quoting these buckle and not. I'm tweeting them tomorrow when I know that they're awake to see it. Mm-mm. Anyway, That's wild, though. I literally was like, I have to be going crazy. And I, I might have let the waters and of no my memory it, go. Like, there wasn't a Twitter thing? I know. I was like, why I'm are surprised. we? <laughs> That's, why I'm like, That's why I was like, I, I'm confused. So I was going to let the waters of perfect memory thing go. And then when Show Yourself happened and she said, you are the one you've been waiting for, I was like, absolutely not. Because also, maybe... I'm sure that everyone on that team doesn't know that, which is why I'm like, you need to though, because a lot, like in recent years, a lot of people have been saying iterations of that. Like we are the ones we've been waiting for all these different things. And I'm Uh, like, let's not forget who originally said that though. Yeah. So they probably don't even know that Alice Walker said it, but it's like, you get paid too much money not to know. Yeah, no, no. Um, like I didn't recognize the quotes, but I'm like surprised that like more people didn't, um, or didn't say anything about it, at least on Twitter. Um, I mean, well, Sykes is an old essay, so unless they had recently read Sykes of mm-hmm. Memory, like it's not like an iconic thing, like she's not known for that line. I mean, she's known by me, I don't know. Like, I mean, if a Morrison scholar had been sitting in that room, they would have been like. Yeah. Excuse me? But I don't know how many people are reading Toni Morrison's nonfiction, particularly like those essays from earlier as opposed to like going through her novels and and whatnot. So it's very possible that people did not catch both of those things. No, Disney's in the city. So remember when they tried, what was it they tried to copyright uh, Dia de los Muertos? Or some iconography associated with that when Coco came out? (laughs) Where there was talks of it. I just remember there was like murmurs. And then people yeah. were like, they better <laughs> <than that." laughs> Disney is in cities. That's why I'm like, I can't be, I'm sure that all of you didn't know, but I can't be sure that none of you knew. And either way, I'm going to make it known. Like, eh. next thing we know, the color purple and um, <laughs> it's a Disney property. <laughs> It won't you can go to the theme park or is it called purple uh, section? <laughs> there would be a mass insurrection if that happened. Like the color of purple is an icon. Like you're not gonna get away with that. You're not gonna get away with that. Mm-mm. They 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 had to stay in the nonfiction register to get away with it as it is. If they start going into the novels, someone's gonna pull their card. Thank goodness. Especially because of the movie. Like, <laughs> these are our icons. These are our touchstones. Disney Disney knows. I feel like Disney has a kind of a sense of how far they can push before they get pushed back because they've been at this for too long. You know where the line is. 
So, so I guess wrapping up the discussion, um, was there, we kind of talked about things that we didn't like from like an organizing perspective, um, an editing perspective. Was there any like analysis in here where you're like, that's just, I don't, this methodology doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, bringing in Sula. I was like, stop oh, okay. this. Mm -mm. You didn't say that. I'm, I'm wasn't a fan. Baffled that, I'm, that I didn't remember that. Because I feel like that's something that would have stood out. Because I was like, when she brought up Mel Hopkins, and I was like, this is a horror book, yes? I've been trying. <laughs> so I'm surprised that, like, if she brought up Sula, that I wasn't like, Sula? Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to find it this whole time. And I thought that I marked it, but alas. And as soon as we say goodnight, it will come back. It'll my book will just randomly fall open to it, but yeah, I would. I think that the way people use Sula is interesting in general. I, because my colleague was just told me about a lecture that another colleague of ours gave where he was talking about something else, and I was just like, it's very interesting how people invoke Toni Morrison in her literature. And when they make that choice to do so, and and for what purpose, and it's just like. Okay, sure. That's a very interesting choice that mm -hmm. I don't quite follow. I'm trying so hard to find it, but I'm just it was just it was just very random. That like it says a lot that I can't even remember what chapter that would have been in. Yeah, I'm, I feel like it must have been the last one because I remember the first one was all about two properties the second one there wasn't really any literary analysis in it that i remember and then the third one i feel like was mostly talking about um Milo hopkinson and nadia core mm -hmm. um so i feel like it has to be the last one Well, if if and when I find it, I will DM you just so you can see one. it. <laughs> just so you can see it for yourself and be like, yeah, this is um, this is interesting. Oh, I think it was somewhere. Whatever, I will DM you. But I definitely was like, this doesn't even look like it should be here. Oh, here it is. It's on page eighty-one. Eighty-one. So it's in the Black Woman Writing Fluid Fiction. Oh, I lied. I do not think it was in there. And she's arguing that like, so it's when she says, um, I further suggest that Jackie's lack of partner and her subsequent emotional and physical destruction parallel that of the titular character Sula of Morrison's 1973 uh, novel. All right, right. She's talking about, what was it? Greedy Choke Puppy by Nala Hopkinson, which is about uh, I think a woman doing some um, ritual to get a husband. And then she's talking about, who is it? Jackie's desire for her husband, I guess, and the life that she wanted to lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just didn't really, look, <laughs> because like, and writing dissertation and writing the book are not the same thing. But mm -hmm. in writing this dissertation, I have moments where I'm like, oh, this is sort of like a parallel moment and that. But you can't necessarily write every single moment that it that pops into your mind as a parallel. If it's gonna distract your reader. And she doesn't like, it's not long, it's a paragraph, but it's just like, but what do you gain? from bringing up Stula. Because now you're talking across genres and you haven't made a case for how Stula would be a part of fluid fiction. So it just seems like in a way you're comparing apples and oranges, in a way you're falling way back, back, back to a general argument about black women being reprimanded for gen for um for for behaving in masculine masculinist ways and a masculinist society like that and that's not what you said we were here for so it's like you, give me the rules here and then can we play by them because this analysis seems a little 
stilted. Like she falls back on respectability, like black women's respectability to make this parallel. And I'm just like, but we're in the fluid fiction chapter. So why are we? I just had a whole lot of like Deborah Cox moments where I was like, how did you get here? That was just my song of the book. That was just me. This is me. I was <laughs> like, you're in that and I'm never asking you back to my channel. Oh, it makes this stuff sing nonfiction so fun. Um, I don't know if there's anything I outright was like, I disagree with this. Um, I was kind of, hmm. I don't know, this is just like another thing I thought was interesting was when she talked about um, fluid fiction and mm -hmm. Mr. Mine and how, um, <sighs> um, how <laughs> Uh, Nala Hopkinson, um, like, kind of blurs the lines between um, deities in Sister Mine and, like, um, mm. cosmologies. And this might just be something I think about later, but um, I, don't know, I remember Bethany C. Morrow talking about, because I have to read a, a book for book club, um, A Song Below Water by Bethany C. Morrow. Um, and I heard Let talk me know how that goes. I don't read anything into my smile. You began to smile, so I just returned it. Bye. Have you read it already? I've tried to read it. I got a little bored. That's all. So let me know how it goes. I finished it. It was um. Those are three stars. It was okay. I'm just. I'm like. I don't want to turn it into a song below water review because it's not the May wrap up yet. But I'll just say that I'm very picky about magic systems and like real world parallels. And I don't think that if you want to tell a, a store that uses a magic system to parallel some real world thing to make a point, I don't, I think that it still needs to make sense in world. Um, and I basically, yeah, that's basically my thing. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but I was just thinking about that because she also bring, uh, Moro brings in a Locos for that, um, novel. And I think she had talked about in interviews, people asking her about, why she didn't stick to the lore more and why was the Aloko like anyone can be an Aloko because I, I forget where Alokos are from but I thought it was like associated with like a very like, specific ethnic group in Africa and in the story anyone can be an Aloko um and that she'd taken other liberties with the lore and yeah, uh, I know this WC reader, if she's still here. I know that she, um, I had read her review and that's why I was worried picking it up. But um, yeah, um, I don't know, I'm just thinking about in general, like when you distort or like blur things that are taken from a real culture like what is the purpose of the distortion um and how are you making sure that's doing what you want it to do because i thought that was like an interesting thing to point out in the chapter but i was like um i guess um in terms of like nella hopkinson's um sister mine i was just kind of like I don't know if, she, she, if I don't know if Brooks really said like to what purpose other than just like pressing boundaries and like not being contained. Um, and then, which, uh, no, yeah, which like to by her own admission, these black women are not being contained. Like 
N that's what Nala Hopkins says in the interview that she quoted. Like, I prefer, spec I even think of it as speculative fiction because it is horror and fantasy and dark fantasy. And like, so she, like, they are not contained. The, the non-containment is why you are feeling the need to create this new genre. So to me, it just, her logic undid itself as for like why we need fluid fiction. All the reasons that she was saying we need it, I'm just like, that is just giving me reason of why it's unnecessary. But that's just me. I guess for me, yeah, I mean, I guess there was an analysis of it, so I can't think about how it would apply to a song below water, but it's something I'm thinking about. Um, I mean, we could probably apply it to a bunch of different other fantasy novels. Like, you know, it's not like uncommon for someone to write from like a culture they're from and then be like, I want to change this or jazz up that. And then people are like, yeah. not sticking to the source material. And they're like, but it doesn't have to if I don't want it to. Yeah, I mean, like, I think there's a lot of fantasies coming out now that are doing that. Like, which is steeped in gold, I know, is um, she, that's from her Jamaican culture, Shannon Smart, and um, Tommy Adeyemi's Children of Blood and Bones is Nigerian inspired, which is her culture, um, the Gilded Ones by Nami No Foreign is inspired by Sierra Leone. So, I, and, and it is like inspired by, not completely like this is the exact, like mm -hmm. that's why they call it source material. Like I'm sourcing from it. I'm not just like rehearsing the entire literary canon or oral canon or whatever. But I think the thing is like when it's not your culture that the source material is coming from, you gotta be careful about like whether it gets read as a distortion or whether it gets read as a blank inspired world. Mm. We have one person who likes fluid fiction. T's liking the idea of fluid fiction. It didn't move me, T. It, I was like, that's speculative fiction. Explain to me what your issue with speculative is. And she she goes into it, but I'm just like, To Chloe's point, like, what is the the working utility of that? Because you are talking about writers. Are they? Is this going to be something for literary critics, or is this something that you want writers to be doing? Because and I, Chloe made a really great point when we were talking in DMs, and she was like, "Nnedi Okor for coined the terms African futurism and African jujuism, but Nnedi Okor for is." Um, a writer as well as a literary critic, much like Toni Morrison. So when these writers, when these scholar artists say, and they're speaking out of their practice and making these theoretical points and making these genre interventions, they have a mind toward the practical. They're saying this for a reason. It just seemed, I, I didn't get, the, I didn't get that same grounded intervention from fluid fiction. I'm a study studies or have a question. What about if the source is your culture, but you weren't raised in that culture? Which is, I've heard, the case with Tommy Adi and me. Yeah. But what, like, what about it? I don't know. I think it was just like a, if we wanted to talk about it. Um, I think you got to be careful with that too. Yeah, it, is, it does get really sticky. Um, because, like, I mean, with the example of Nella Hopkins and, like, that is stuff that she grew up with. Um, mm -hmm. With the Locos, I don't know if Mara talked more about it. Um, and it's also, I guess, like, I'll just say that for me, this is mostly, like, thought experiment type stuff because, like, I'm not a writer. Um, so, like, I can't really give hard and fast rules and stuff. But, like, I think a lot of it also is, like, the work that happens in interviews and, like, Mm. And stuff and being like this is the source material and like this is the change I made and this is why I made the change um and like so that things don't just because sometimes people pick stuff up and they just think that it's like all like a one-to-one -one and they think they're just gonna learn something like it's a non-fiction text and then they run with it and then 
that's not where it's intended to be, but like right. due to lack of people talking about it, that's not what it's supposed to be. That's mm -hmm. what happens. Um, I mean, there's also like talking about people being, I know, I think with WC Reader is talking specifically about people like in diaspora and like, like relationships to source countries, because that is something that has come up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like that comes up a lot with um, books I'm seeing about the Caribbean. Um, and like, that's probably just because I follow Kiki. <laughs> Let me not say that comes up a lot. That comes up because I follow Kiki. Um, and so that's why I've been seeing it. But um, there's like that and like the separation that comes there. And then also, I'm thinking also of like Rebecca Roanhorse who was like adopted. And so it's different with her because she's, um, her dad's African-American. I think that her mother was Pueblo and I think she was adopted by a white family. And I think it's also like complicated for her and that was like an involuntary separation and like, mm -hmm. you know, just like histories of like, yeah. specifically like um, adoption and like Native American people. Like, I don't know if you know about, was it the, but basically there was a law, I think that was started to like make sure that um, indigenous American kids weren't getting like adopted off a reservation if they were born on one because there's like issues with trafficking and like abuse. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I don't know if it was like state or federal stuff, but like just like, or we could talk about like foster homes and like, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, there's conversation now around Nakia Bryant who was um, teenager yeah. who was recently by yeah. the cops. Um, was due to, I forget exactly what, but she had been in foster care. I thought there was abuse going on. She'd called the cops for help and they shot her. And there was talk about like, she'd been living with her grandma and she'd been taken out of custody with her, from her grandma. And then there's talks about like foster care in the US and mm -hmm. ooh, yeah, these kids are disproportionately taken away and who are they given to and stuff like that. So like people's separation from like a culture can be like also very like, a sensitive thing like I know Rebecca Roadhorse was like getting harassed and stuff and people are saying that she wasn't actually Pueblo and like it was it's kind of like a it's kind of it was a mess it was a mess um so I think people are like they don't want to like be like harassing people about the authenticity and stuff but also it can get tricky when stuff gets taken as fact when it was like a distortion yeah. and like people are like removed and don't feel responsibility to like be open about these things. Um, mm. I think it's the utility of authors' notes, also. Like if there's a if there's like some cultural, like if it's based off of a culture, you can acknowledge that. And authors' notes um, talk about like your sourcing and encourage your readers to do your own, their own research and point them in a particular direction. Um, that that's also useful in author's notes. So that was a like very long tangent. I don't, I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> in my head, these things make sense. And then I say them out loud. I'm like, I don't know how much it made sense after all the backstory I had to give, but yeah. I mean, no, um, yeah, it makes sense. It was a very roundabout. <laughs> answer to the question. The original question was, what about the sources of your culture, but you weren't raised in that culture? That's a very roundabout question. Answer to how people become separate from cultures and when readers have had issues with that separation and how it affects the story that's told. Um, that was all the questions I had for this book. Um, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? Not I, but I'm, Kiki just, I'm just looking at Kiki. What book are you, I think I know the one. Um, let me double check the title before I get on here. Well, I mean, actually, keep you probably just saying from the first page of one of them. Okay. I don't know which one she's talking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of books coming out that are like from Carib Caribbean inspired fantasies right now, and I've heard. I haven't read most of them. I'm not really reading a lot right now. Well, that's not true. 
I am reading, but I'm just close reading. So I'm reading the same books over a long period of time. Um, so I'm not like just like reading numerically and not a lot of books right now. Most of them are just like fluff to get me to give me a break from like the closer study. Um, so I haven't read a lot of these newer books that are like, yeah, um, Jamaican inspired or whatever, whatever. But I have heard like murmurs um, to use Chloe's term of like, yeah, that that was gotten from like, you can tell she got that from stories from family while she was at home on vacation visiting as opposed to like something she grew up with. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I would not know that, but like Jamaican people or Caribbean people being like, yeah, the way that it's being applied is really strange. And I'm like, okay. Kiki said, there's a couple, but the one she's talking about was Your Corner Dark by Desmond Hall. I haven't heard anything about that. I'm assuming it's a contemporary for historical. Um, I'd heard you talking about Hurricane Summer. 10 page glossary, terribly wrong patois. We had persons doing polls trying to find anyone who knew them. That's, uh, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Listen, yeah. Yeah, so that it's just very interesting, which is why when Miss WOC reader was like, "What if it's it's their culture, but they're not like you know didn't grow up in them?" Like, you still gotta be careful because people still gonna pull your card. Yeah, but yeah, that's all I have. Um, sorry, I'm getting sleepy. It's late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that was everything. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for talking about this book with me. Um, thanks everyone who popped in to watch and talk with us. Have a good night. Bye.